uh, the topic of these meetings is going to be um, the political institutions uh, of uh, the European states. And these will be aggregated into groups of states. And um, we're going to kick off with the Central European states, right? right. So uh, thank you very much again, Professor Zotti. Uh, I think most of you know him because we have many uh, PISA students in here. And um, so you, you may already know he's a, a lecturer at the Catholic University of Milan, as well as a um, lecturer here at Kafoska University of Venice uh, of uh, international relations. And yeah, thank you very much. The floor is yours, Professor. Thank you for being here and accepting our invite. Just a little reminder, how much time do we have each time that we're going to meet? Um, maybe around an hour and we can keep the, the rest for uh, potential questions. Right. That's okay. fine for you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, talk to you. Uh, also, this is a sign of a strong engagement by students, and it is also an opportunity for me to strengthen my ties uh, with the uh, with the university, with the Kafoska University, also because I'm relatively a newbie uh, over there. Uh, as I just started uh, two, two years ago uh, to collaborate with Professor Legrenzi. Uh, but of course, as you might imagine, my first year was only uh, from Milan. And so basically, this is the first year that I'm actually physically uh, teaching there. And I'm really enjoying the experience. Um, so um, when I was asked to um to 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 participate um in these um a series of lectures um we came up with the idea of dividing up uh, the membership of the european union into geographical groupings um because uh, well first of all because it appeared to be as good as any other criterion for uh, approaching uh, the the topic uh, but I think that uh, it was a good idea. I, I was pers um, persuaded by the appropriateness of this approach because uh, it allows us to take a step back from um, the, the grouping, the political grouping that uh, has been going on throughout the integration process. Um, in the sense that um, if you think about it, uh, since the start of the period that we're going to uh, talk about, uh, incidentally or not, um, in our meetings, that is the so-called um, crisis of the integration process, so this, this sort of existential crisis that the European Union is uh, supposed to be, uh, I mean, is arguably uh, is going through. Um, we have seen how much emphasis media, but also policymakers have put on dividing uh, northern countries, northern member countries, and southern member countries. Um, we the uh, underlying unsaid but not that implicit uh, assumption that um, southern countries were those most unruly in terms of fiscal policy, uh, in terms of um, compliance with European rules. Um, and those groupings, if you think about it, uh, were also interesting because they tended to, um, to lump some, to, 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 to bundle together also countries that shared those characteristics without being geographically southern. For instance, in the famous peaks, uh, there was Portugal, of course, uh, Italy, and, but the, there is a second E, which was Ireland. Um, in, in that sense, uh, if you think about it, what does Ireland uh, have in common with 
uh, southern European countries. It is a Catholic country. Uh, and so, of course, this might ring some bell uh, if you think about your studies in the history of political thought, about Weber saying that uh, capitalism has much to do with the Protestant ethic, uh, not only of work, but also personal ethic and moral, um, uh, moral things in general. Uh, and so, um, taking these apparently neutral, uh, starting from, from this apparently neutral, neutral point of view of just dividing up uh, countries as they are, uh, we can also approach the other groupings a little more critically in order to see whether uh, these groupings are actually consistent or not, or they are just uh, easy uh, mental frameworks that are used by media, by expert or so-called expert in order to make sense of what happens within the European Union, uh, but also by policymakers in order to pursue their political agendas. Um, and so, uh, and, and of course, uh, once said that, I, it, uh, it seemed to me uh, only reasonable to start with continental countries uh, because um, if there is one thing that every textbook uh, telling the history of European integration is the fact that uh, at least until a certain point, until let's say 15 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, uh, when the, these, uh, the, the, these issues started to fade away, but it re-emerges every now and then, uh, what was um, identified as one of the main drivers of European integration is the so-called uh, Franco-German engine. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that uh, the commitment of these two countries is essential to uh, European integration. It doesn't mean that uh, other countries have not, played, uh, have not played a major role uh, in the whole process or that uh, there is a hierarchy within the European Union, but uh, at least everybody agrees uh, that at certain points, at certain crucial points of the integration process, um, the engagement of these two countries was at least a, con a conditio sine qua non for the, the integration process to go on. It's not a sufficient condition, but it is one that the integration process so far uh, hasn't seemed to be able to uh, do without. At the same time, though, the importance of this uh, Franco-German engine should not be overstated in the sense that it is when we say the German, the, the, the Franco-German engine is important, when we say that, we tend to um, conflate the political initiatives of the heads of state of these two countries with the integration process as such. In that sense, we tend to overlook the role of the European institutions. So the, the Franco-German engine has only worked to the extent that it has found um, a companion in the uh, positive approach of the Commission, first of all, but also of uh, the European Parliament uh, that with, uh, with the years uh, have, has been uh, gathering more and more power uh, within its hands. Um, and uh, starting in the 80s, that particular kind of presidency, of collective presidency, that was uh, that at the, at the beginning was only informally the European Council, and then after the Lisbon Treaty, 
uh, as a full, uh, full, fully recognized institution. So having said that, um, let's say that um, these criteria that we've picked of choosing the, 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 the members of the European Union, it should never be misunderstood for the assumption that member states are the only drivers of the integration process, okay? Of course, they are major players as um, scholars of uh, European law uh, like to say they are the owners of the treaties. And that's true. But at the same time, what makes the European Union such a strange animal? What makes the European Union something completely different from whatever we have we've had the opportunity to see throughout the centuries in terms of integration of political units, the European Union, no matter what your personal feelings, your political opinion, cannot be considered any longer just an international organization. It's not an international organization, for sure not in the classical uh, meaning of the term, that is an instrument, just a forum for countries to cooperate, to share information, to pool their resources in order to achieve their goals, but not, uh, not even in more advanced senses, like um, transnational organizations, private international organizations, the European Union, in that sense, is something, is something utterly completely new. And it is completely new. When I say that, uh, I'm not um, expressing any enthusiasm. Uh, I'm just being very analytical in this sense. New in analytical terms is not inherently good. The European Union can still fail. The European Union might prove in 10 years, in 50 years, in 100 years, just a big failure. But if we look at things as they are right now, we are faced with a completely new polity. I hope that you're familiar with the term polity. When I say, when I use the term polity, I mean a political entity which, is not which does not necessarily share the same features as the state. So the, the, the power, the mighty influence of um, the national ideology, not the nationalistic ideology, just the national ideology. So the idea that each people is entitled to have its own uh, political organization in a state and the, um, the effectiveness of that particular polity that is the state in providing services, in uh, securing um, representation to the people um, and in providing security in organizing uh, and governing to a certain extent um, social, uh, local, transnational, supranational, international phenomena, that, that's of course something that can, hard, can hardly be argued against. But at the same time, as political scientists, we have to be at least open to the possibility that the state is not the normal form of the political, okay? The fact that over the last four centuries, if we uh, agree on the tale of the 
peace of Westphalia and the creation of the international system and so on and so forth, which is something that you are well aware not everybody agrees on, meaning that um, it doesn't mean that Westphalia was not important, but it has become important as an orthodoxy. So we as European tend to focus on that specific moment when the religious war were, uh, were quenched by uh, the invention of the modern state and of the modern international system. Uh, but at the same time, we are, we are overlooking explicitly experiences that had been uh, um, done uh, in other parts of the world. So in that sense, let's consider the European Union as an experiment of a new polity which contains states in which national states are still major players, but it is not just the sum of those states. The European Union pursues interests, defend, protect, advances values uh, of its own. Hmm? And states are well aware of that. So in focusing on these specific countries, we are, throughout these meetings that we're doing, we are also looking at the European Union as such. Hmm? So the fact that we focus on certain countries does not mean that countries are the only things that matter in the integration process, okay? And so in that sense, why starting with continental Europe? Because according to the other thing that you're going to find in every book, uh, presenting the history of the uh, European integration is the idea that one of the reasons why the European Union better, the European integration process was started, because don't forget that the European integration process, of course, has the European Union as the most advanced uh, instance of um, institutional uh, result, but we also have the um, Council of Europe. We also have the Organization for Economic Cooperation in Europe. NATO, in a sense, is also uh, a, a big participant in the integration, in the European integration process, despite having a, also a, an Atlantic dimension. NATO played a big role in integrating uh, European countries. Anyway, all these efforts with all these, all these array of different uh, institutional results, it's at least in part based on one big question that European policymakers were faced with at the end of the Second World War. How to avoid that the Third World War would start in the following years. And being somewhat blind, be all better in denial of what was happening after the, the, the end of the cycle of, of World War II, that is power being transferred to non-European countries, considering the USSR a non-European country and the US. They, let, let's say that they assume that the Franco-German animosity was still the biggest question on the table. Okay, Germany was defeated, but still Germany had been defeated also in World War I, and uh, they were well aware of how things had panned out the first time. Also, the US were also quite worried about that, not because they thought that the European, the, the Europe would be the main question of a possible uh, 
worldwide conflict, but Europe still maintained a very strategic relevance because if a third world war was to be fought, that would have happened in Europe, right? And why is that? Because remember that until the mid fifties, the USSR didn't have the atomic bomb and ballistic missiles were still far away from being invented. You know that the only uh, atomic bomb, uh, bombing that has ever happened had the two bombs delivered by plane. And of course, those planes didn't take off in the US. They had taken off from uh, Allied in the Pacific, right? So the war that everybody feared of was still a conventional war that was to be fought, of course, in Europe because the Red Army had garrisons in all the countries that had been turned into socialist countries. Berlin basically was, if the USSR had started the war, of course, the first to fall would be Berlin because it was detached from the rest of the German territory. Of course, the rest of Germany, according to any plan available at the, at the time, was also taken for fallen at the very first attack of the Soviet Union. It was only, it was only a matter of being able to address the problem before Soviet troops would arrive to Paris or to Milan. Okay, and so basically what diplomats and policymakers and heads of state were all scrambling about back in those days was receiving assurances from the US government that they would intervene before the whole Europe would fall under Soviet rule. Okay, so in that sense, the reason why Europe mattered a lot to the US was that they needed Europe to be able to fight back as well as they could the Soviet invasors in order to give the US time to deliver their troops to Europe. Also the US having become much more than they already were before the war, the hegemon of the Western international system, in order to be an hegemon and not just a big power, you need legitimacy. And that legitimacy back then with the, um, um, the colonization process still to come was only able to be granted by European countries. Okay, plus of course, Japan and a few other, South Africa and a few other countries. So the US were very interested in having a free Europe, a, um, European countries that would abide by the credo of uh, capitalism, of liberal democracy, uh, well, better, Capitalism was the main thing. Then, if they were also liberal, democratic, better. The important thing was that they, they would comply with the rule of being open markets, because if you think about Greece in the 60s, you know that, oh, I mean, Spain and Portugal were not liberal democracy, but they were fairly open in economic terms, so for the US, that was enough, okay? Like, of course, in uh, South America, th they basically applied the same, the same idea. Liberal democracy, if possible, but the market could not be done without.
So all the eyes, in that sense, for different reasons in Europe and uh, across the Atlantic Ocean, were fo all focused on France and Germany. How are these two going to live together without falling into the revanches uh, that had happened the 30 years before, um, without having friends trying to uh, rule over the rest of the um, the rest of the continent, especially now that France had been uh, officially given uh, the label of uh, the uh, one of the winners of the war, with the seat with, with, with the standing seat in the um, in the Security Council uh, in the United Nations and everything. Um, of course, I imagine that you all know the idea that. Um, having a uh, shared use of uh, resources like coal and steel uh, would integrate the two economic systems. Uh, so the story, I, I take it for granted uh, and that you already know that. The important thing though, is that whatever the original reasons for these two countries being those who counted, the equilibrium between the two has changed to the tune of what is relevant in international affairs throughout the decades. So this particular balance, if you think about it, was based on France being, in a sense, the political winner on the continent, beside, of course, the United Kingdom. But the United Kingdom um, had other ideas uh, in terms, so you know that, you know the old saying, fog on the channel, Europe is isolated. In the UK, they, when they say Europe, they don't include themselves in Europe. Europe is the rest. And then there is the UK. So in the continent, France was the big political player. And that political role would be increased when France became uh, another, when France joined the nuclear club when France got the bomb. Whereas Germany was the big economic player. Divided as it was, Germany regained its economic might, its, its economic proudness in a very few decades. And so this balance until from the beginning of the integration process to the end of the Cold War was based on this complementarity between France and Germany. France would be the big political player, Germany a big economic player. There were also other comp complementarities. For instance, when the integration process started um, and for the following decades, much of the budget of the European Union went to the common agricultural policy. So basically 70% of what the European Union did had to do with agriculture. At the beginning, of course, it was, the reason for this is, was, uh, was that um, after the war, all European countries were interested in becoming as uh, self-sufficient as possible as self-sufficient as possible because no European countries over the last 800 years has ever been self-sufficient, okay? When mm, those of you who attended school in, uh, in Italy must remember Bava Beccari shooting on uh, protesters uh, in Milan because uh, the, the prices were going up 
and bread was particularly expensive. That is one of the first signs of globalization because that year there had been a famine in Ukraine. And so we couldn't import wheat and corn in general from Ukraine. That's the reason why prices went up at the end of the 19th century, right? So um, European countries still depended on international trade, but of course having a wealthy uh, agriculture was something that was welcomed by, govern by governments in order to maintain, in order to feed its own population. Also, you have to consider that despite the third uh, industrial revolution being already underway, most of the European population still lived in the country, on land. So distributing resources to farmers was a way to gain political legitimacy political consensus was a way to make voters happy. That is another big bargain, another great deal that was, uh, that was reached by the France and the German governments. That is while most of the resources pulled together by the six uh, original the founding members of the European Union would go to agriculture, meaning benefiting the most agricultural oriented countries, which are, of course, France and Italy. Germany would benefit from the opening of the markets the creation of the single market. Because Germany, having an industrial potential that was much bigger than that required by its own population, had an interest in having wider markets where to sell its output. So in that sense, when we that's one of the things that uh, I want you to uh, get from uh, these talkings of ours. When we say that two countries find an agreement, we shouldn't just focus on what the heads of state, like, uh, you know, uh, Adenauer uh, and uh, um, General de Gaulle thought. Big players are important, big personalities played a major role in the European integration process, but the European integration process was from the very beginning a matter of policies, not only of politics. It was about making constituencies happy. And if we look not only at decision makers, but also at constituencies, we see that, and these can be found in documents, these, um, international relations historians uh, are well aware of that, we can see that there was a big pressure on the Christian Democratic Union in Germany coming from big businesses to go on with the European integration process. They were technologically advanced. There were not many other uh, big players throughout Europe. So Germany had everything to gain from having a Europe, uh, a market on a European scale and not only contained within national borders. So the trade-off was Germany would have the opportunity to sell its technologically advanced goods to the rest of Europe. France would benefit from 
having not having to go through the same speeds of industrialization as Germany, keeping its own constituencies, which were to a much larger degree, people living on the land, farmers, happy with receiving not subsidized. They were not subsidized. That's another big thing with the European integration process. The European integration process is in a sense an element in a process of economic modernization that Europe went through right after the war in which we have the liberalizing action put in the hand of the European institutions and the nurturing aspect of the, the political economy left in the hand of national governments. Think about it. What is the only thing that the European Union today has still no power on? in terms of economic policy. Maybe fiscal policies? Taxation. Taxation in particular, right. And why is that? Because you, a policy maker, in giving up the power to set who is going to pay taxes, and how much taxes they're going to pay, how do you win elections? If you cannot promise, I'm going to lower taxes, I'm going to let you retire at a young age. So pensions and taxes, they are still firmly in the hands of national governments. Whereas with the monetary policy, Member states had relatively fewer problems to give them up. Hmm? Because constituencies are not really interested in that. Hmm? What was the big problem when uh, governments, well, apart from the German governments, were still able to manage their own monetary policy. Central banks were independent, weren't they? What, sorry? The central banks of, 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 the, of the states, of the European states were independent, weren't they? No, for, no only formal, only formally. Actually, in Italy, for instance, the president of Banca d'Italia would receive daily phone calls from the Presidente del Consiglio in order to set interest rates to the level that was more convenient to the government. And what was the result of that? When, when is the government that puts pressure on the central bank in order to set interest rates to the more convenient level. What, what's usually, what was historically the result of that? The increasing of the, the government debt? Not directly that, it was inflation, right? Because there are two ways that the government can can get money. One is from taxes, and the second is by inflation. By inflation, by putting out money, right? And why is that? That's connected with what Alberto was saying. Because if I issue public debt bonds, and then I have inflation, 
after 10 years, I'm paying back less in purchase power than what I got in advance, right? And why did people not complain about that? Because inflation is like bad weather. It's nobody's fault. People constantly complain about high prices. Over the last 10 years, we had one of the worst periods of deflation in history. Have you ever heard someone complaining about prices going down? Of course, gas is always too expensive. When I get back from the supermarket, I've always spent too much. And we had prices going down from 10 years. So as people complain constantly about things being too expensive, if there is inflation, nobody's going to point their fingers, well, unless it happens like it's happening right now in the US, where the Republican Party has nothing else to complain. And then they say, it's Biden's fault that there is inflation. But it is not usually something that is used in the political discourse. Whereas if taxes go up, then of course, it's the fucking government that is taxing them, right? If the government asks me in order to lower the pressure, lower the costs of the, um, of social services, like the pension system, of course it's the government's fault. They want me to die on my job place. Hmm? So in that sense, whereas states, states were left with the duty of looking after the citizens, of making them happy. They were put in a position to be able to go on being welfare states, looking after the welfare of the people. At the same time, though, with a demographic dynamic that was still ongoing. So what do what what's what was the big demographic phenomenon right after the war? The baby boom. The baby boom. Population growing, living standards going up, the average life expectancy becoming longer. Of course, all the um, all the conditions in which welfare states had developed before the war were untenable after the war. Welfare state before could make big promises because people would die at 65. Hardly anyone would go to get the, the actually their pension. And people living in the country, they wouldn't be formally employed. They would just get the minimal pension. Whereas when the bigger share of the population moves to the secondary sector in manufacturing, then you become an employee and you have rights. You go to the hospital, more children, more vaccinations, older people, more people to look after. The health system costs will go up. Aware of all that, they decided that they needed a sort of, to add a bit of liberalism in the economic system, but not wanting to pay the price for that, they sort of handed the job to the European communities. 
it would be the European communities in charge of breaking up all the rents that existed back then. Who are the losers when a, a single market is created? All of the comparatively disadvantaged industries in, a, you know, any in a country which isn't the country that you're in. So, yes, that, but not necessarily disadvantaged in what sense? Uh, in the sense that they are industries which are historically uh, mm, sustainable in that country, but which then once you open a market are no longer producing at a cheaper price than the same industry, the respective industry in another country. Exactly. Or even if they are economically viable in a protected market, protected by tariffs, I mean, they might face rising costs in terms of investment in new technologies in order to be competitive on a wider market, right? And for instance, in Italy, who was going to be hit by the creation of the, sing of the, of the single market? Fiat, right? Before then, buying a car, of course, there weren't many that would buy cars, but before the single market started to work properly, which didn't happen right at the beginning of the integration process, it took some time for the single market to actually kickstart. Before then, when there was the boom in uh, car production, where each family started to save to buy a car, tariffs, which Fiat was able to get, to get from the government, because of course Fiat being a great lobbyist would be able to access to the policy making decision and ask for tariffs protecting their production. In exchange of what? Why the government did say yes to the request of fiat? Because the tariff is a tax, so it, it increases the tax revenue. Yeah, but that is not. Because if, if, if those tariffs were, were so high that were actually said to prevent the importation of cars. So they didn't get much from those taxes because they were so high that it, because the, the, final, the final goal was to protect the Fiat's production. So what, what did Fiat give in, in exchange for that special treatment? Votes in the elections. How? By saying to its employees, well, the government is helping us. Uh, well, it's not exactly the Catholic Church, uh, and not even those. Uh, all well, th there were lots of people who went to church, and they would hear from the priests vote for Democracia Cristiana, and then would vote socialist or communist. No, fiat would give back social peace. They would hire more people. They would set up new firms, new, um, new factories in disadvantaged, in disadvantaged regions of Italy, in Sicily, in Naples. Those, would, those were uh, industrial choices that Fiat was very unlikely to make if it was not for the agreement they had with the government. The government will protect you from external competition, and then in exchange, you will give new jobs, not only to the population in general, but in particular to those people who were mostly in need of that in the South. Hmm? 
And of course, being a virtual monopolist, fiat was also able to keep prices up. And in keeping prices up, fiat could afford to pay comparatively high salaries to its employees. Right, so this little equilibrium proved to be quite untenable. And so countries like Italy, in a sense, sacrifice the interests of their rentiers in order to gain the use of policy means that would allow public finance to become again viable, manageable. So otherwise, the expenses that the government would have to uh, to, to, to face would be just uh, untenable. Okay. Then, of course, the history of the single market is not one, it's not a very linear one. When the single market was created, of course, tariffs were eliminated, but what the government, what governments started to do in order to keep helping their uh, the big firms, the national champions, as they used to be called, was applying non-tariff measures, like, for instance, taxes of other kind on engines, on cars with engines bigger than a certain uh, degree, which was, of course, a way of protecting your own car or with um, issuing rule regulations that would set standards that would put out of the market products from abroad. And indeed what the European Commission still does is looking for these non-tariff measures that government keep trying to, uh, to introduce in the system in order to protect their champions. So the single market is not something that is achieved just when tariffs are eliminated. It's a work constantly in process because the European Commission has to scrutinize all the measures, all the taxes, all the regulations that governments issue that might end up or they might be designed exactly for the purpose of protecting their own uh, firms. So in that sense, in this division of labor, Germany was a sort of, uh, was like the master in a, a, a role play. It played both for its own interest, but its own interest was particularly um, overlapping with that of the European Union as such. Why did Germany accept to get the shorthand, the, the short end of the stick in the deal with with friends. Because of course, right after the war, Germany was in search of international legitimacy. Germany was the devil. Germany was the country that has started two world wars. And its experience in participating in international organization had been so good up to that moment that Participating in these, in yet another uh, enterprise like this, creating Europe, the uh, European communities, was something that Germany saw as another step towards being readmitted into the international community. 
And in that sense, while France would see the participation in the European Union as a way to maintain with the help of the rest of the European countries, a good degree of independence from the US. So in that sense, European integration in the eyes of France was a way, especially uh, under the rule of General de Gaulle, was a way to create sort of a third pole between the US and the USSR. In that sense, for instance, that's the reason why um, the, um, the nuclear weapon uh, owned by the French government uh, back then was, um, was named Force de Frappe, meaning that it was not just a, an instrument of the West dominant hegemonized by the US, but it was something that would, um, uh, that would allow France and, and its political allies to have some degree of uh, strategic independence. On the other hand, for Germany, it was a way to be readmitted into the international community. And the two sort of, the, the, the two different ultimate goals sort of uh, compensated each other in the sense that whereas for Germany, participation into the Atlantic Alliance was not something that was in a trade-off with European integration, for France, that was the case. For France, the more Europe would become integrated the more independent it would be from the United States. Whereas for Germany, for Germany and for Italy, actually, the two things would go hand in hand. And so in that sense, having said that, having said that we had governments and economic, social economic interests all agreeing to some degree to cooperate in order to further the European integration. You can see why the first crisis, the first big crisis that uh, the integration process had to face occurred when the, when the Cold War ended. Because when the Cold War ended, all the other European countries, all the other governments was faced with the old fear of having a big reunited Germany that would, that was at least hypothetically likely to abandon the integration project, which bound Germany to the rest of Europe and pursue their own uh, hegemonic project over Europe without all the constraints and all the uh, institutional boundaries that had been created throughout the decades through the European Union. And what is the other big thing that it, is not, it, it had started uh, some years before? but that gains momentum when the Cold War ends. The possibility to compete with the US? Through what? Uh, I mean, through the union of like different economies. Mm -hmm. Like, you mean in, in which sector the US? Yes. Oh, well. What the, what's the big project that, is, that, gain, that gains the central stage right after the end of the Cold War in the European Union? The Eurozone project. The Eurozone. Hmm? And why do you think is that? 
what is who was the only the only reliable currency in Europe before the euro the German franc the Deutsche mark the Deutsch, yeah. the Deutsch mark. mark and mark. why do you think Germany gave up that and instead pull their own uh, strictness and reliability and the independence of the Bundesbank and let Italians and Greek piggybacking the very functional uh, German system. In order to reassure the other members of the European Union that Germany would not go its own way. You let us reunite and we'll give you extra insurance that we are committed to the integration project and we'll give up the crown jewel, the Bundesmark. We're going to share all the gains that we get from having this very reliable currency with all the other countries. We'll face all the uh, moral hazards of having other countries, like it happened in Greece, for instance, having very low interest rates thanks to the fiscal policies applied in Germany without being so strict in the public finances as Germans are. It is very telling that right after the, the end of the Cold War, the fall of, of, the, of the wall, what happened was that for the last time, and it was the first time since the end of the world, of the war or, the, or World War II, the four winning nations would meet again. So Gorbachev and all the others reconvened as the allied that had won the war in order to discuss this very worrying matter of Germany reuniting again. Now it's something that, especially for people your age, might seem quite simple and linear. Okay, the, 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 the division of the war in two spheres of influence is ended. It's only natural that the two Germanys merge together again. Well, back then it did not sound so expected. The Democratic Republic of Germany had existed for decades. It was a well-functioning state, economically pretty advanced, considering all the uh, all the, 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 the consequences of having a socialist system, but there were products that were imported in the West from East Germany. They had a technology so advanced that their products had a market in the West even. And so that reunification was something that policymakers had to work pretty hard on. And it was the object of big political bargainings. One of those being the exchange for so this sort of official reassurance by Germany that they would still be very engaged, very committed to European to the European integration process. And in that sense, helping France to interpret its own participation in the process and the rest of Europe, which we are going to see in the next, uh, in the next meetings. 
Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor, for the insights that were great, in my opinion. Yeah, I I took notes from the lecture you take, because, um, yeah. And, okay, so I see that we're still many, comparatively to <laughs> how we started. Yeah, we lost uh, a couple of, you know, viewers, but we're still good to go. people, actually. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So... I'm glad to see that. And if anybody has questions now, uh, the floor is yours. If uh, Professor Zotti, of course, agrees. And yes, of course, of course. Okay. I have a question on um, this last step that we just did regarding the Eurozone process and the introduction of the Euro, because especially now in the past five years, you know, there's been the was it 20 years of the establishment of the euro and all these you know studies have come out about which country has gained most and which country has lost the most and um and you know it, it came out that germany and the netherlands are the countries which have gained the most for, for various reasons it's not you can't just single it to you know the the fact that italy and france can't devalue their currency anymore that's definitely a big part but it can't be the only part competitiveness and things of the sort um but i was wondering if um you think, Professor Zotti, that in addition to, I don't know if this is too cynical, but in addition to the, the kind of the requirement of proving themselves, you know, uh, open to cooperation and, um, and, and kind of setting down the sword and saying we're not interested in, a, in this hegemonic role anymore, if Germany also very much aware of the strength of the Deutsche Mark, just because all of the European currencies were pinned to it, or, or in one way or the other, you know, base the, the, their value on the Deutsche Mark if they were aware of, you know, the fact that a, a united currency, a single currency across Europe would also benefit them in terms of competitiveness and then in the ability to, to dominate the export market and have a trade surplus, et cetera. Well, um, that's a very apt question. Uh, well, first of all, remember that uh, throughout the 90s, uh, Germany was usually addressed as the big sick man of Europe. So it, it is not that they started to gain from uh, having um, the uh, European, the, 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 the sing because Euro was introduced at the beginning of the, of the 2000s, but uh, currencies were uh, synchronized um, earlier. Um, in that sense, you're right, because as I said uh, before, uh, the, the goal of having a larger market was right there from the very beginning for Germany. So they would gain that, that for sure. But uh, what put Germany really in the position to start one day to gain from that was that the the fact that basically the European Central Bank was shaped according to the model uh, offered by the Bundesbank. Uh, but it, that was not something particularly new because as I was saying, when I said that Germany is sort of like the master in a role play, is the fact that Germany and the European Union have a very similar institutional setting. Uh, meaning that, for instance, uh, the fact that um, the, in the, the, the independence of the Constitutional Court, for instance, is very similar in Germany and in the European Union. The fact that Germany as a polity is very multi-centered, is not very hierarchical. There are different places, different loci of power. The Bundesbank, the Verfassung Gericht and uh, then the government. And it's sort of like the European Union. You have the Commission, you have the European the Central Bank, and then the Court of Justice. And then within the uh, institutional triangle, you have the Council, the European Council, and so on and so forth. So as a very pluralistic system, Germany was shaped in the same, let's say, in the same context of creating 
the conditions for power not to be held in the hands of just one institution or one person. And the European Union and Germany were sort of uh, designed according to the same blueprint. And with the creation of the European Central Bank, Germany was able to achieve the big goal of keeping that thing going. Only this time, for the first time, it was not Germany who would adapt to the will of the others to avoid that power would be held in the hand of a political institution, but be depoliticized. And for this time though, that was something that Germany benefited from, having a central bank that would act according to the same rules as the Bundesbank. Of course, that was also a condition that was quite strongly uh, argued for by German negotiators. We're going to offer our stability. We're going to give our commitment to the project only if you accept that the, the European Central Bank, for, you know the fact that the European Central Bank uh, has um, these as one goal, unlike the Fed in the US that has two goals, right? So the Fed has the goal of maintaining the stability of price. So price stability is the first big goal. And the second goal is to help the economic system to thrive. So interest rates are set in order to, of course, fight against inflation and deflation when, when it's the case, but also to, um, to favor investment uh, and to, to, to keep the economy, the economy going. Whereas the European Central Bank has as the ultimate only goal, maintaining price stability. Whereas it's up to the governments with their economic policies to favor economic growth. And we don't have to, we can hardly overlook the fact that in Germany, what made Germany so competitive and so, as you were rightly saying, export oriented, were the internal reforms that the country went through under the Schroeder government. So basically, and this is something very peculiar of Germany, basically unions agreed to have the salaries contained, to not have them um, adjourned based on the wealth created by the whole econo the national economic system, in order to keep the profits high, the profits of the firms they participate in high. Consider that in Germany, usually unions participate in the administration of the firm. They have a seat in, on, in the board. Unlike it happens in other places where unions are at odds with the managers. So Germany was able to keep salaries low. And in doing that, of course, you benefit your, uh, your trade balance because you are very competitive. You have a very high quality uh, output and at the same time, prices are low because unlike when it usually happens, if you are an econo a socioeconomic system that can produce the knowledge needed to create high quality, high technology products, then salaries go up and you become less competitive. Whereas in Germany, they were able to do that. And those reforms, especially uh, having been issued by a socialist, a socio-democratic uh, government, led government, were a very big part 
So, of course, Germany benefited from the conditions created by the European Union, but I strongly think that without those reforms, we wouldn't have the same amount of power uh, that Germany actually uh, has within the European Union system. Go, Alberto. Hi, Professor. Um, I had two questions, actually. One, yeah. which is uh, quite straightforward, and I was wondering whether the um, the policy that Italy pursued with uh, uh, with Fiat can be considered as a kind of uh, at least similar to an import substitution policy, uh, maybe similar to those that we have seen in Argentina's and Southern American countries. And the other, uh, it's about infl the, the inflation. So uh, if I understood correctly, your reading of the inflation is that it was, it was uh, advantageous for, uh, for governments in Europe. And um, so we had a high period of inflation uh, around the first years of the 70s with the, especially with the, with the opiate crisis. Uh, and especially in Italy, had it, uh, inflation has been really high for 10, 15 years. Um, but isn't, uh, and isn't there a really high political cost in inflation in terms of uh, instability of uh, prices and, uh, and of course, wages? And well, in, in hindsight, we know that, but back then, in the 70s, inflation became a big thing, and you're right, but it was something new, actually. It was something new, and, um, and you're right in saying that um, wages uh, suffer from having high levels of inflation, but if you think uh, about what happened in Italy, we had the so-called scala mobile, which means that wages would adjust automatically to the level of, to the price levels. Uh, so in that sense, they neutralized the um, negative incentives in having inflation because wages would just go up. And of course, when, when there is inflation, the debtor always gains. And the biggest debtor was the state, the government. Mm -hmm. Not all wages got, went up for, with the Scala Mobile Sociala. What, sorry? Not all wages, not all wages. Not all wages, but of course. Maybe, uh, maybe those, those that were important for the political consensus. Exactly, okay. exactly. Yep. And about, uh, about fiat, uh, yes, in a sense is, um, well, uh, just consider that right after the war, um, national champions were both practically and analytically um, were just the standard in economic systems. Basically, every econom national economic system uh, had uh, its own national champions, not necessarily in all sectors, but there were strategic sectors where there was just one big firm that would be uh, strongly subsidized uh, openly or not. So in that sense, yes, uh, you're right in finding uh, parallels between what happened, what was happening in Italy and elsewhere, because it was basically the orthodoxy of the time. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yes, sir. When you talk about inflation as being like uh, good for governments, are you referring to uh, financial repression? To financial, sorry? Uh, the um, concept of financial repression. I admit that I'm not familiar with this concept. Would you please enlighten? Uh, mm -hmm. no, it's something like um, when you have like high inflation rates, um, given by the fact that the government can put interest ceilings on banks. So there are different methods to have like, um, financial repression, but one of these could be that you can put like low interest rate ceilings on banks. So then you can uh, borrow money 
uh, with a low rate, uh, but uh, I, I don't remember like how the, the relation goes on, but then uh, you end up with like uh, uh, high inflation and low rates. And in this manner, you can erode the value of uh, your, the government debt. Well, uh, yeah, but well, it, it depends. Um, I understand what you're saying. Um, I'll send a link now. Yes. Um, as much as I can see, uh, it is basically, it only, it's only different in the sense that if you put a ceiling on uh, the, uh, the level of interest rates that banks uh, can apply, you're operating directly on banks. Whereas if you have direct access to the central bank, the central so interest rates by um, commercial banks are set on the interest rate that is set by the central bank. The central bank um, uh, sets the uh, interbank uh, borrowing uh, rates. So in setting that, it sets the basic criterion based on which banks would then decide what uh, interest rates uh, they're going to apply to the clients. So uh, basically it is, the final result is exactly the same, you're right. It's only that instead of operating on commercial banks, you go all the way up to the central bank uh, because of course, you know that when banks lend money, they don't have the money they lend. Not, not because they don't have in the, uh, in the safes. Money are constantly borrowed and lent between banks. So setting the interbank interest rates is crucial for the monetary policy. And that what's, because even, this, this always happens with uh, my students in the first year, when they, when they use the expression printing money, they, they are really convinced that the, the bank prints money and put it out in the economic system. No, it's just lower interest rates in order for more money to be put into the, into the system. And the, so the way that the central bank increases or decreases the amount of money that circulates within the system, and of course, uh, as a result, inflation, uh, is in setting the interbank uh, interest rate, because this is something that banks do constantly. So if they have to make a big investment because they they buying uh, the Italian national then a share of the last issuing of the of Italy's uh, public debt bonds, then of course a bank has to invest money, but that money. It's not available and they have to ask other banks for having the money to do that. And in recreating, and, 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 and of course, in the, in the structure of costs, if the interest rate that they have to uh, act according to is high, they're going to have high interest rates when they lend money to private, uh, to companies or uh, just uh, citizens. Okay, thank you. All right, guys. So You're I muted. think it was. Oh yes. Please, please go on. I <laughs> think it was a very good start, uh, and I guess that uh, the more we're going to see each other, the the more lively the interaction will be. Also, <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. Thank you very much again. Okay. And yeah, see you next time in two weeks. Okay. okay. Thanks for your time.